here. Um, my name is Patricia Vollmer and welcome to the Board for Operational Government Meteorology monthly webinar, which this month is going to be featuring military meteorology, or uh, as we say in DOD, Department of Defense, we call it METOC, so an abbreviation, which I believe has its history in the Navy. They like to use the first few letters uh, to, to create the acronyms. So, um, I'm going to start with a brief introduction of, of myself and just explain a little bit about what I do as uh, more people. I do still see people coming in, which is, uh, which is hopeful and exciting, so thanks. Um, so my name is Patricia Vollmer. I am retired uh, Air Force, um, uh, actually Air Force Reserves, and I served for 25 years in an assortment of roles. And I kind of wonder if I got picked to be the moderator because I am currently a joint me talk officer, which means I neither work for the Navy, nor the Air Force, nor the Marines. I work for uh, a level of command that includes members of all of the services. So I do work with a uh, me talk team that is a combination of uh, civilians, Air Force uh, uniformed members, and Navy uniformed members. So uh, I work for uh, headquarters NORAD and United States Northern Command. And so our job is Homeland Defense. So we are watching our nation's borders, not just in the United States, but also in Canada. So um, I do want to go over the format of this web webinar today. It's, um, oh, I got a pop-up. Let's get rid of that. Okay. Um, just to let you know, for those who are here, uh, this, this meeting is being recorded. So I do want to let you know that's happening. So um, I guess Zoom protocol now, if you're uncomfortable with it being recording, being part of a recording, then uh, I guess you just don't stay. I'm not sure, but uh, just so you know, it is being recorded. So uh, the format for uh, this one hour webinar, we're going to divide it into three parts. So we're going to start with a uh, presentation about Navy's military meteorology and oceanography. And that's going to be presented by Lieutenant Commander Kellen Jones. And then we will pivot to a presentation about Air Force and Space Force uh, military meteorology and uh, Earth Science Services. So um, that will be presented by Lieutenant Colonel Tiffany Cunningham. And then we, uh, the, we anticipate 15 to 20 minutes for each of those two presentations. And then that should leave us 15 to 20 minutes for questions and answers at the end. So you are welcome to uh, ask questions and answers verbally uh, during that part uh, at the end, or you can use the chat window and you may ask questions as they pop into your mind. And um, we have uh, Keith Sherburn, who's the, uh, the one who's called AMS Commissioner. Uh, he is moderating those questions and he'll help us make sure that we don't forget about them as they come along. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Lieutenant Colonel, I'm correction, Lieutenant Commander uh, Kellen Jones, who's going to talk about uh, Navy and Navy me talk. Thank you, Patricia. As let me uh, share my screen. Can anyone give me a verbal you can see my screen? I see your screen. All right, thank you. So as uh, Patricia said, my name's uh, Lieutenant Commander Kellen Jones. I'm a Naval Meteorology and Oceanography Officer. Um, I'm honored to be here to present a little bit about what we do in the Navy. First, I'll start a little bit about me. Uh, this uh, presentation is about to help ins inspire people about uh, careers in the military. So I'll, I'll talk about my career. Uh, I graduated from UCLA in 2010. I didn't major in uh, meteorology or oceanography. I actually majored in geography but I think the Navy said that it was close enough. And um, I first commissioned as a surface warfare officer and served in Japan for two years on a destroyer, which is pictured there. Uh, after that, I transitioned to the meteorology and oceanography community and served at Fleet Weather Center San Diego, uh, where I served as a supervisory meteorologist on the watch floor. Uh, then I spent some time at our headquarters at Stennis Space Center, Mississippi, <clears throat> where we handle all the operational control of uh, our forces. And then the Navy sent me to the Naval Postgraduate School. Uh, as a METOC officer, we're required to get a master's degree um, before promoting uh, to 04. And so I did that, uh, graduated in 2018, and then I got selected to do the PhD 
which I'm one signature away from finishing, uh, hopefully, uh, next month. Um, I also got my CCM certification in 2020. And I think uh, the bottom line is that the Navy has a lot of diverse opportunities in meteorology and oceanography, especially for education, which I'll talk about more later. So what do we do in Navy Meet Talk? Well, first of all, it starts with us. So in the Navy, not a ship, submarine, or aircraft gets underway or leaves uh, the flight deck without a forecast or information from, uh, from us. So we touch every operation in the Navy. Uh, the Navy and Marine Corps is America's away team and Naval Meet Talk brings a home field advantage to the away games. We provide uh, the operational commanders and forces with the physical battle space awareness needed to operate safely and effectively anywhere in the world. So how do we do that? Well, here's the obligatory command chart. We work for US Fleet Forces in Norfolk, Virginia. And our operational commander here is Naval Meteorology and Oceanography Command, which I mentioned is in Stennis Space Center, Mississippi. Uh, we have six uh, subordinate major commands uh, on, uh, here on the bottom, uh, the Naval, uh, Naval Oceanographic Office at Stennis Space Center, Fleet Numerical Meteorology and Oceanography Center, which is in Monterey, uh, the Naval Observatory, which is in Washington, DC, Naval Oceanography Operations Command, which is also at Stennis Space Center, and then Fleet Weather Center Norfolk and San Diego, which are our uh, major aviation and maritime forecast hubs. So a little bit about the headquarters. Essentially, headquarters uh, mission is to define and apply the physical environment uh, to support Navy operations. Um, uh, headquarters supports uh, all the major fleets uh, and um, joint forces. It's a fairly small command, but it has a wide reach around the world. The Naval Oceanographic Office at Stennis Space Center's primary mission is oceanography support, so uh, applying uh, oceanographic knowledge to support national security. Uh, subordinate command they have is called the Fleet Survey Team, which is, uh, they do uh, expeditionary surveys around the world. Uh, NAVO has six oceanographic survey vessels and operates more than 140 ocean gliders, uh, slocum gliders uh, around the world. Uh, also operate a number of autonomous underwater vehicles uh, and a survey aircraft. This is largely a civilian command with a small, uh, small uh, military contingent. Fleet Numerical uh, is again in Monterey, California, which is where all of our operational models are controlled, such as NAVGEM. Uh, operates uh, at all levels of, of, of classification from unclassified up to TSSCI. Um, again, a heavily civilian workforce with a small contingent of military. Naval Observatory in Washington, D.C. is the Department of Defense's authoritative source for positioning, navigation, and timing, also tracking uh, the, movement, the, the movement of the stars and uh, the orientation of the Earth, as well as uh, the DOD's uh, atomic clocks. Um, they also have uh, outlying sites and flagstaff, and the alternate master clock is at Shriver Air Force Base in Colorado. Again, a heavily civilian uh, command with a small military group. Uh, getting into the more of the military side, uh, as far as active duty, we have the Naval Oceanography Operations Command at Stennis Space Center, which controls all of the operational and tactical employment of METOC forces. Uh, subordinate commands they have uh, include uh, Naval Oceanography uh, ASW centers, which deal with uh, support for uh, anti-submarine warfare, we also have a mine warfare center and a uh, special warfare center supporting uh, the SEALs. Has a large reachback cell to uh, produce uh, oceanographic decision aids and they operate uh, uh, a large variety of unmanned vehicles. And this is a heavily military command. And finally, we have our two fleet, uh, two fleet weather centers in San Diego and Norfolk and their main mission is fleet safety and effectiveness with aviation and maritime forecasts. Uh, some subordinate commands include the Joint Typhoon Warning Center in uh, uh, Hawaii and the uh, Naval National Ice Center in Norfolk. So our priorities in Naval Oceanography include decision superiority, which is enabling commanders and decision makers with the right information uh, to pick the right uh, platform weapon uh, or the right time for operations. Uh, smart sensing, which is the ability to deploy uh, manned and unmanned sensors and, and, and vehicles uh, when needed uh, anywhere in the world, as well as uh, tightly coupled uh, atmospheric and oceanographic models um, uh, 
to result in longer range predictions. Some of our future uh, capabilities, including uh, expanding our unmanned system capability, which is something that we're investing uh, heavily in. So a little bit specific more to the career path for a Naval METOC officer. This is kind of a busy slide, but uh, the way to read is on top is generally the jobs that you can do as a Navy METOC officer, starting from the lowest ranks, 01 to 03, uh, moving to the right to the higher ranks. Um, so typically when you're a junior officer, you're gonna be de uh, de deployed on some type of unit, whether it's a ship, a survey team, um, an ASW team, uh, working with special warfare, working at the fleet weather centers, the goal there is to get operational experience. Uh, prior to promoting to 04, you'll go to Monterey to get a master's degree in meteorology and oceanography. And uh, once you promote beyond 04, which is Lieutenant Commander, that's where you'll start serving your milestone tours afloat on a carrier or uh, amphibious assault ship. Um, and uh, as you progress in your career, there's opportunities for different leadership um, jobs. Uh, there's a lot of training that we uh, uh, get uh, in route to all of our different commands. Everybody starts with, uh, with the basic course, the basic oceanography assessment training. Um, and from there, as I mentioned, everybody's required to get a master's degree uh, and there's opportunities to get a PhD, which I was fortunate enough to get. Um, typically there's about one, uh, one billet per year uh, for meteorology and one for oceanography for the PhD at, Na at the Naval Postgraduate School. Um, so I'll leave time for questions. My email is at the top if you have anything uh, following this presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Lieutenant Commander Jones. Um, so without further ado, we're going to start the, uh, the Air Force and Space Force uh, presentation. And again, uh, you are welcome to use the chat if you have questions or you may wait until the Q&A at the end and you can ask them through your uh, microphone and camera. So Lieutenant Colonel Cunningham. All right, uh, thank you so much for having me today. I'm so happy to, to talk to everybody today. Um, I'm uh, Lieutenant Colonel Tiffany Cunningham. I'm currently assigned to the Pentagon um, and I am the Chief of Officer Force Development. Um, so what essentially that means is basically um, making sure that the education and training and um, getting people into the Air Force is all on track. Um, I do a lot of work with um, ensuring we have enough ac advanced academic degrees, um, and all of our different uh, training as we go from the, a new lieutenant is just starting out in the Air Force all the way through their entire career field. So cradle to grave training. Um, so that's a little bit about what I do here and um, with my current job. Um, a little bit about my history. Um, I've been in the Air Force for uh, coming up on 27 years. Um, I wasn't always in weather. I ended up uh, getting into weather in uh, uh, 1999. So I've been in that um, for quite a long time. Um, I've got a lot of different experiences uh, in my background, um, everything from doing um, support to the Army, because that is part of what we do um, in the Air Force. Uh, the Army does not have their own weather, so the Air Force does all their support. Um, I've also done um, some space support, doing space lift, uh, working launches. Um, so I got a little bit of that. Um, that was probably my favorite job, if you are um, to ask me. Um, my best experience, uh, absolutely fun. Um, and I've, you know, been on different levels um, in the Air Force, everything from the very smallest unit or a flight, um, leading that, you know, um, all the way to a major command, um, and then of course now at the Pentagon. So um, it's been awesome. Obviously, I'm still here in the Air Force. I, I love every day. Um, I, eventually, the Air Force is going to make me retire, <laughs> and I'll have to leave. Um, but um, I, I've, it's just been, it's been a thrilling ride so far, um, and love my career. Um, so I will go ahead and get my presentation shared real quick. All right, um, can I just get a quick check to make sure the slides are showing up? They look great. All right, awesome, thank you. Um, so um, as we'll go through, um, quick, um, what you're looking at today, um, our Air Force weather um, officer has actually evolved to become a weather and environmental science officer. And I'll get into a little bit of that about why we changed and what that all involves um, today in the Air Force. 
Um, all right, our next slide. Um, all right, you should be seeing um, the Air Force Weather Enterprise. Um, so bottom line, we have about roughly 4,000 total force airmen and that do all this weather support and environmental operations. So when I say total force, that includes the um, reserve, the guard, the active duty, um, and then civilians as well. So we do have you know, quite a few civilians that make up our total force doing all the support. And who do we support primarily? Um, the Air Force, of course, the Army, as I had mentioned, um, and then of course our newest uh, force, the Space Force, um, which is part of the Department of the Air Force now. Um, and then of course the intelligence community. So um, you can see we have a pretty big footprint um, you know, around the globe, um, largely focused um, in the United States, but um, uh, we have a lot of locations in Europe, um, some in Africa, and then also, you know, Japan, Korea. Um, so you can kind of see like opportunities um, where you might, if you do decide to join the Air Force, um, places you could be assigned to and travel to, um, which is really part of the fun um, of being in the Air Force is getting to experience these really unique and um, interesting locations and spend some time there. Um, so what does Air Force weather do? Um, you know, of course, you know, we provide uh, atmospheric and space environmental data and analysis forecast threat warning and threat mitigation products and services. Um, and this is a 24 seven job, you know, it never stops. Um, and who do we primarily support, you know, besides the big service? Um, we, we are the DOD um, authority for um, data services and then also the national intelligence community. Um, so when you think Intel community, think like um, NRO, which is the National Recon Office, um, and NGA, uh, National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, you know, things like that um, for the National um, Intel community. Um, also, we support, you know, the White House Situation Room, interagency allied and coalition partners around the world um, and across multiple enclaves. So um, Air Force weather, uh, you can see on all those little patches, all, our, all the areas we support, um, big, big footprint um, in, in Air Force weather. All right. And then um, a little bit talking about, as I mentioned, um, the WESO career field. Um, we used to be weather officers up until last year. Um, and then it was retitled to the Weather and Environmental Sciences Officer, WESO for short. Um, so you'll hear that terminology, um, you know, in the services, you know, these days um, of that new uh, career field. Um, so um, basically, this change evolved from a, um, a severe weather readiness assessment a few years back, and it highlighted our effectiveness in the career fields integration across all types of severe weather phenomena, um, and especially, you know, um, you know, the integration of environmental data and atmospheric analysis. So we were kind of already doing this the whole time um, with the support that we've been providing, but now we took ownership of it um, in, in the Air Force. Um, so that we could actually expand our capabilities beyond just terrestrial weather. And so we actually offer a full spectrum environmental impact of integration. So we encompass all the geosciences now um, that have the you know, impact to operations such as hydrology, climatology, polar meteorology. Um, and, you know, you can see that whole list down there um, and areas that we're expanding into. Um, and like we, I mentioned, most of these have already, these capabilities are already utilized across Air Force weather. Um, and so now that is who we are. Um, we still are maintaining our core weather expertise with aviation and resource uh, protection. So um, by that, meaning we still have to have um, quite a bit of our core, um, still have the weather qualifications to meet a World Meteorological Organization, uh, BIPM, uh, which is the basic instruction package for meteorologists, you know, so that those degree requirements, we still have to maintain that core to support the aviation because Air Force, airplanes, you know, a lot of them. So, <laughs> um, but we expanded, our, we are expanding into much more beyond that. Um, so um, with that, we've um, actually um, adjusted our accessions um, by the term accession, meaning how do you, this is like the process of getting into the Air Force or into a military um, and being accepted um, in this case as an officer. Um, so that is what accessions is. Um, so if, you're, if it's a unique term that folks, um, accessions includes, you know, various STEM degrees now. So, um, so we are now allowing um, up to 20% of uh, people to come into the Air Force or into the WESO career field um, without a meteorology BIPM degree. Um, you know, again, it has to be a STEM degree. So we'll take uh, people with math, you know, chemistry, you know, of course, we're really, you know, looking at the, you know, hydrology. So if you don't, quite have, you know, the BIPM requirements, um, you know, we'll definitely, you know, consider taking 
that, but we're only, we, were, we are limited to only 20% because we do have to maintain that core for the BIPM. So um, that's really, really exciting. This just all happened within the last um, year or so. So very, very new. Um, one of the other things, um, once you're in, um, we do offer uh, quite a bit um, of advanced degrees, you know, with masters and PhDs. Um, again, a lot of them are correlating to that full spectrum I had mentioned, you know, that's down below. Um, we're continually um, assessing, um, incorporating more things, you know, as capabilities and requirements change in the Air Force, um, that means we need expertise in different areas. So now we actually even include degrees in data analytics and data assimilation um, to meet these, uh, the future technology needs. So we are sending people to school to get their masters and PhDs in those areas. So, um, you know, again, core still being weather, but um, with the option to branch out. Let me go to the next slide real quick. All righty. Um, and again, I'd mentioned the um, total force um, and what we meant by that. So we do have active duty, which that means full time, you know, um, support and that, you know, can we have active duty, you know, that does the support for the Air Force, Army and Space Force, um, as I mentioned in the first slide. So that's full time, you know, active duty. Um, you can retire after 20 years, get a pension. Um, really cool. Um, and that's what I've been doing. Um, so 27 years of active duty. Um, that we also, for those um, who are interested in doing it part-time and getting the experience and, um, and even like some educational opportunities um, and in the experience, you know, opportunities, of course, um, we do have the Air National Guard, which is support to the state and then also the Air Force Reserve. Um, and of course, you know, that is, the reserve actually has um, quite a bit of a range of missions and um, different you know, experiences. Of course, everybody's probably heard of the Hurricane Hunters. That is a Air Force Reserve mission. Um, that um, is out of Keesler Air Force Base in Biloxi, Mississippi. Um, they get to fly into hurricanes. Um, another job that I, you know, if I had like five careers, you know, five lifetimes to have careers, that would be one of them. I'd, you know, always look really cool. Um, so um, I know that's a pretty popular one for everybody who um, joins the Air Force Reserve. Um, but they do have like space lift as well. And then of course, um, um, a few other um, jobs in the reserve. So. Um, I just wanted to make sure that everybody is aware um, that we have these opportunities, you know, aside from active duty um, on the WESO career field side. All right, and then getting in a little bit into some of the career paths. Um, we have primarily like two big ones um, um, as a WESO career um, operations, and I would say the scientific uh, technical are the two most popular ones, um, or the biggest ones that we have. Um, and of course, um, we do have blended ones like the operation technical where um, basically, so operations is, you know, actually um, you're going out, um, doing the job, you know, um, getting um, nothing but experience. And of course you are getting education, uh, but maybe not to the same level as the scientific technical one. Our scientific technical track, uh, most people there, um, you were talking away all the way up through PhD, um, and they get to work on all sorts of different, um, you know, prob you know, different issue sets and um, on the very technical side. Um, of course, you know, with that, I mean, you're still doing leadership, um, you're still doing those opportunities, but your focus is more on the scientific te technical piece um, and, and that. And then of course the operations technical is, you know, a true blend where you're, you, know, you might go and get a master's. Um, and that's the one I did. I did the operations technical side where um, went and did my master's, um, but then I stopped there, but, you know, continue to do operations um, and supporting, you know, different um, you know, aspects of the militaries. Um, so, yeah, all, all paths lead to goodness and promotion. There is no path that you're going to go down a, you know, dead end road. Um, they're all great. It just depends on what you want to do, where your areas of interest are, and you, you know, can certainly you know, ask for those kind of things. Um, also, we have uh, the space focused operations where um, you're focusing on space weather um, and space phenomena, um, you know, anything that impacts, you know, like um, uh, all the conditions from the sun and the uh, near earth environment, magnetosphere, ionosphere, you know, think of, you know, those type of things that impact our, you know, space and ground systems. Um, and then also lift, you know, falls into that space lift, like, you know, like working in the launches. Um, and then um, the other two, uh, career broadening, um, those are things outside of Air Force weather, um, where you will go, you could um, go say be in um, like work, you know, foreign affairs, um, um, 
or you can work uh, all sorts of different, you know, to, you know, strategy on the Air Force side, all different types of opportunities there that are not Air Force weather, but then you come back to Air Force weather. So you get some, you know, opportunity to step out of the career field for a bit. Um, and then um, our information warfare, where you can actually move in and out. You, you start out with weather, but then you can um, go out and do some intelligence jobs. Maybe your focus is intel, and then you come back to weather. Or you might be you know, focusing on um, operation analysts, and then you come back to weather. Um, so lots of opportunities to move in and out of weather and, and get all these really cool different experiences and education that comes with all of these different career paths. Um, so. Um, definitely, I would say a good variety. Um, this is, you know, this is why I love, you know, doing the, the force management job because it's just amazing to see all the different options and, you know, uh, career paths you can go down um, as a weather officer or WESO in the, in the Air Force. All right, and I, so a little bit about educational opportunities I wanted to hit on. Um, so, yeah, the Air Force and the WESO career fields. Um, so the Air Force by nature is a very technical, career field, uh, or say technical force or technical service. Um, so with that, you know, weather and WESO um, is, you know, of course, very STEM oriented. You all know that, um, no brainers there. So we really, really desire the higher education. Um, we don't require it, like I know, um, it was interesting to see that, you know, that the Navy actually requires it for promotion uh, beyond 04 or to get to 04, um, but we just offer it as a choice, you know, so you can apply for your master's programs, you can apply for the PhD, no forcing mechanism. I highly encourage our folks to do it. Um, it's highly, you know, desired, um, but it's there. And with that, you know, um, it's free education. You can take it with you when you leave the military um, and you have all your credentials, which is really, really awesome. But then, you know, the Air Force, of course, um, they're gonna expect you to pay some of it back, not as in money, payback, but with time. Um, if you do sign up for these programs, um, you're going to have to owe back some time, of course, um, serving uh, once you do apply. Um, but, you know, once again, you're getting that experience, um, putting your degree to work, um, and the time goes by really fast. So it's not like a huge payment. Um, we're talking, um, you know, pretty much like uh, four and a half or years for a master's and five years for a PhD is like what you owe the Air Force after you graduate. So, um, but it goes fast. Um, so, um, and some of the places we go, of course, for education, um, Air Force Institute of Technology is the primary one. We also send people to the Navy Postgraduate School. That's where I actually did my master's, um, so, um, which is, you know, great, great school. Um, and then also there's, we send people to civilian institutes. So you can go to Florida State, uh, Texas A&M, you know, um, all sorts of different civilian institutes we send folks uh, to to get their, you know, master's or PhDs. Um, so those are all really awesome options for education. Um, so, um, and then also, um, again, kind of speaking to, you know, I mentioned as technology advances and, you know, we need to grow our capabilities. Um, we also have programs that are maybe a little bit, you know, uh, a little bit different. Um, we have education with industry where we send you off to Amazon for 10 months um, to learn, um, you know, their business practices. Um, that's a really neat program. So you come back and um, then we'll send you to a really awesome job putting that um, experience to work. Um, and, and then, of course, growing your experience, um, which is which is pretty awesome. And then, um, you know, we also branch out, like I'd mentioned, you know, into the computer science, um, operations research, you know, getting the operations analyst, um, and then like the data analytics side of the house. Now, for all of these, um, they're all like one, you know, position a year we get for these special programs at the bottom. Um, for masters and PhDs, we usually get, um, you know, three or four PhDs a year, just depending on the year. And then like, you know, eight to 10 masters, you know, per year. So um, usually if you want to do it, it's not a problem. You're going to, if you just put your name in the hat and you have good grades, um, you qualify academically, um, you'll, you'll get it. So um, the top bottom three are a little bit more competitive. Um, all right. And we're getting actually like close to my final slides. Um, just wanted to throw up some pictures. You can kind of see some of the cool, like once again, when I talk about operations and missions and experiences um, that WESOs are into, um, similar to the Navy, um, operations, flights, you know, pretty much anything um, the military does um, will not start without a weather briefing or a, or a weather analysis or a weather forecast from a WESO. Um, or some, you know, or weather representative, you know, from our civilian force, our enlisted side. Um, it always starts with that. So 
um, even before the mission gets started, um, the, the weather is going to be involved with doing their um, impact analysis and all that ahead before it even gets going, um, you know, and then like before they even like then when once they start the operation. Um, yeah, weather is like usually either the first person or second person to brief, like right off the bat. Usually we're the first ones to brief. Um, so yeah, one thing about weather, you got to be great at talking. Um, you got to love talking in front of crowds, um, talking to people, um, providing your insight. So, um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of briefing, a lot of talking involved in this job. Um, so um, hopefully, you know, if anybody's considering this, uh, you know, stage fright, you know, got to get over that, you know, find a way. Um, but um, it's a lot of what we do, um, but you can see in there, I mean, we have actually, I put the parachute um, picture in there, you can see we have jobs where people, you know, as weather officers, yeah, you can go, when you go support the Army, you, there are, um, op, there's jump jobs you can do, so you actually get your parachute wings and qualifications to, to jump. Um, again, if I had, a, you know, five careers in my lifetime, that would be another one I wish I would have like had the opportunity to do um so um but again it's like there's only so many you know uh, options to do um so you got to kind of choose wisely um and um pretty much i think and I, you can also see i added the ai on there that's like our biggest thing i just wanted to throw one last little thing out there um for um our where we're going in air force weather um, we are definitely embarking on the AI world right now, and actually Air Force Weather is kind of leading the way for the Air Force in that with um, uh, one of the cool capabilities that's being developed, which is a global synthetic uh, weather radar. Um, so um, we have weather, our Air Force Weather um, folks that, you know, all, you know, like actually going out and get, getting the education in AI. Um, I'm actually enrolled in an AI course myself just to, you know, um, kind of learn to be able to speak the language a little bit better um, to help, you know, develop, get our force developed. Um, and like, what do we need to do to start introducing that topic? Because pretty soon we're going to be using um, that system, you know, in our baseline. And um, we need to make sure that we're training our folks, um, you know, so they know how to, like what the biases are, what, you know, what does the global synthetic, synthetic radar even composed of, you know, um, what, it, what data is it pulling from? So they know like how to apply it operationally. So, um, but that's where we are leading the way. Um, so, uh, one thing about, you know, Air Force weather, it's like getting out ahead, getting really some awesome capabilities. Um, it is a lot of fun, um, but I will go ahead and stop talking and open it up for questions. Thank you, Lieutenant Colonel Cunningham. Um, this is now the point in the webinar that we want to just start a question and answer session. Um, let's make this a, a just an open discussion. Um, so please, there's no there's no such thing as a bad question ever, ever, ever. So uh, don't feel badly if you want to ask through the the camera and the mic. You're welcome to. If you are more comfortable using the chat, you're welcome to go to the chat also. And I will now be quiet. Now, if you don't have questions, you're going to be dealing with my my question bank of awesome uh, additional information that uh, I came up with that I thought would be fun for the team to answer. Oh, come on, you must have questions. All right, you guys but are. Looks oh, like we one. did get a Yay. chat. Yeah. So it says, in your roles, how much do you interact with meteorologists in other sectors? And I'm assuming that means like civilian, um, like private industry or the National Weather Service, right? So who wants to go first? I'll go first. Um, so from, <laughs> from the resource protection standpoint, uh, uh, over CONUS, we definitely coordinate with the National Weather Service to make sure our watches and warnings are synchronized. That's definitely a big, uh, 
Um, a big issue is making sure, you know, when the weather service has a, a certain warning, we make sure we have the same warning and making sure that our forecasts uh, are synced. Um, we typically also, you know, work with them for expertise on areas that maybe we don't have um, uh, local expertise in. Um, we work with the Air Force a lot, especially um, out in the field, uh, forward deployed. Um, you know, depending on the mission, you may have an Air Force uh, weather officer briefing Navy forces. You may have uh, a Naval officer briefing, uh, briefing Air Force uh, forces. But aside from that, uh, in my experience, uh, any of that interaction is going to happen on the civilian side with research and development. Um, so uh, there's something called ESPC, Earth System uh, Prediction Capability, which is a large effort between the Navy, the Air Force, NOAA, on really syncing uh, Earth System Prediction Capability uh, nationally. Um, so there's a lot of interaction there, but operationally, uh, not as much uh, as probably there could be. Over. Yeah, um, on the Air Force side, um, I, I know we leverage um, on, the, on the National Weather Service side quite a bit, especially when it comes to tropical. Um, like I've been in jobs where we're on telecons and doing forecast coordination for like the, um, especially the hurricane prediction on the Atlantic side. Um, cause they are our lead. They are the designated experts, you know, in forecasting hurricanes and hurricane tracks. Um, and then we'll take their information and apply it to our installation impacts. You know, what we're expecting at certain um, bases, um, our installations. Um, so um, a lot of collaborative, so there's a lot of um, areas where we um, exactly like, you know, Lieutenant Commander Jones had mentioned um, where we just don't have the experience. And of course we leverage the oceanography side of the Navy cause we don't have that experience in the Air Force. So. Um, they are the authority on the ocean. So like as we're putting together Arctic strategy, for example, um, we're going to look to the Navy to get, you know, the ice analysis um, in the Arctic because you know, we don't have that. Um, and they, they have a whole center that does, you know, ice. So, <laughs> um, so yeah, there, there's a lot of cross flow, a lot of collaboration among the services and, um, and, and like civilian um, side as well. And we work a lot with WMO um, to develop the basic meteorological instruction package, you know, um, the BIFM I'd mentioned. Um, and those standards, and we're doing that right now. We're look, we were on the you know phone with people around the world, like um, actually looking at those. Um, so a lot of opportunity to cross flow and um, work. But at the end of the day, you know we're responsible for our, our service support. <laughs> so hopefully that answers the question. Um, I think let me add one thing, um, kind of to to dovetail on what you said. So as as you mentioned, there's a lot that we do that isn't weather. So uh, in the Navy, we do, we have uh, an astronomy and astrometry mission, so there's a lot of coordination there, uh, but also uh, hydrographic survey. So the Navy is the authoritative source for uh, hydrographic information around the world. So NOAA handles uh, our coastal waters, but we handle the rest of the world. So uh, for, uh, you know, oceanographic, na you know, navigational charts that NGA produces, that data comes from us. And so there is a lot of coordination globally with the IHO, on standards and practices for surveying and uh, different efforts to share and get information from other uh, sources. So um, there's a lot that we do that isn't weather and those are the areas that have a lot of coordination outside of um, uh, you know, the Navy or the Air Force. I'm gonna throw one more thing and that is um, actually two more things, but one is bigger than the other. So, um, just to piggyback on some of these other concepts, but the um, Space Weather Prediction Center, which is part of NOAA, um, I, I actually uh, have correspondences pretty routinely with that team, part of what I do um, with, with all the radar systems that NORAD's using to detect incoming threats. Um, they're, they're incredibly sensitive to uh, uh, coronal mass injections and geomagnetic storming and, and uh, effects of uh, aurora, um, in our case, the aurora borealis. So um, that's that's a civilian organization, which I would argue are meteorologists, um, a lot of them with the specialized training, of course. Um, but the other thing I want to mention, um, just the plug for the AMS, um, I personally have the most interaction outside of military meteorology with um, what I do for, with AMS. So if I'm going to meetings or I'm preparing to present perhaps or uh, the interactions such as this. Um, 
So hopefully that answers Elise's question. Um, we do have a second question in the chat. It says, um, this is from Steven Weinstein. Hopefully I pronounced that right. I apologize if I didn't. Um, as someone gaining a master's in emergency management, how do you utilize this field in your operations? So um, I'm gonna let the, uh, the, the presenters speak first and then um, if they don't cover what I have in my mind, then I can speak my part of it too. Okay, um, yeah, I can definitely jump on that one. Um, so like at least um, for emergency management, that falls into an entire separate career field um, apart from weather. Um, so um, they actually have emergency planners at every installation um, on the, in the military. Uh, um, so, and they actually work in the emergency um, operations uh, cell or whatever, the EOC they call it. Um, and then we also have them on, you know, of course in crisis action team, big venues like that. Um, there's actually emergency management planners. So it's, it's definitely utilized um, in, I know in the Air Force and in the DOD. Um, but um, in terms of uh, weather or WESO um, support, um, we definitely coordinate with them and, and pr actually provide them the support. So um, we'll provide them forecasts, we'll provide them data, you know, with weather, depending on what the emergency is um, that's going on. Um, you know, firsthand experience, um, I was out at Vandenberg when that range started on fire and 12,000 acres burned and we almost lost a loaded rocket with a satellite. Um, that's how close the fire came and almost lost all of our space lift. Um, so we are working, you know, with the emergency management and they actually called in extra emergency managers outside of the Air Force um, to work that problem. And so, cause it was a big fire uh, with a lot at stake. Um, so, um, yeah, so weather was very, very involved with working with emergency management, like their coordinators, the cells, and providing that data. We worked with the, um, so um, even they, they even called in a special fire forecaster from the National Weather Service um, because they specialize in fire forecasting, another area we just don't have. Um, so we worked with that fire forecaster to, you know, do the data collection, to do the predictions to fight the fire. Um, I also got to work on the Air Force crisis action team at the Pentagon level the last couple of years. So again, um, as you know, hurricanes come rolling through and as you know, we lost Tyndall Air Force Base to Hurricane Michael a few years back, again, working with emergency management folks. Um, yeah, we utilize, you know, we, we work a lot with them. Um, we are definitely in sync and, you know, they pretty much tell us what they need and we give them the information. Um, that's, you know, we all work together as one big team. So. I guess over to you, Patricia, or? Uh, Lieutenant Commander Jones, yeah. he's unmuted oh, yeah. and oh, ready. Yes. Yes. <laughs> what I would add that the Lieutenant Colonel didn't is that, um, so obviously we work with emergency managers, um, but I think a lot of METOC officers in the Navy have either certificates or uh, you know, additional degrees in emergency management. And the reason why is that uh, as, METOC, as METOC officers, it's important for us to get you know, to step out in front of the science and get better at communication. And any degrees that, uh, especially emergency management, that stress communication and coordination with non-scientists is absolutely critical and essential and valuable. So, especially in emergency management, because that's, I mean, that's the whole idea is being able to talk, uh, you know, talk in, in different languages to different, uh, especially, you know, to, to different experts. Um, so while we don't directly uh, work uh, in emergency management, uh, that field is definitely applicable, uh, especially when it comes to making better decisions, how to use science to make better decisions. And I mean, I think that's where, what emergency management is all about. Um, I like the idea of having the uh, additional credentialing for emergency management. I think that fits in really well with what um, many of us are doing day to day. So um, I can speak to my current position with um, US Northern Command, who has a mission, uh, it's called Defense Support of Civil Authorities. So the abbreviation is DSCA and we just say DISCA. And this is, um, we're, we, we make forces, military forces, military capabilities available if a civil agency needs Department of Defense's help. So that's, that's how DISCA works. So um, one of, and 
Lieutenant Colonel Cunningham mentioned the tropical weather and the importance of having uh, uh, communication with Department of Defense capabilities. Um, after Hurricane Katrina is a classic example in 2005, when the infrastructure was so compromised, um, we brought in the USS Iwo Jima, so this, this a uh, large deck um, amphibious vessel came right up the Mississippi River, pulled in the port in New Orleans and was able to provide uh, command and control. So meaning they had uh, working communications, they could keep tabs on where people were, where people needed help, where supplies needed to go. And that was a Department of Defense asset. So um, METOC forces, we're, we're not, necessarily directly talking to FEMA. FEMA was the organization who made that request. We're not talking to FEMA directly, but we are helping our military organization coordinate with FEMA. Um, another example that Lieutenant Colonel Cunningham brought up was the fire near Vandenberg Air Force Base. Uh, my organization gets to work with an organization called the National Interagency Fire Center, which is a national level coordination of capabilities to uh, combat wildfires. Um, wildland fires, that's the official term. So um, examples of this are some C-130 aircrafts that can overfly fires and, and drop uh, fire retardant uh, chemicals on, on top. Um, there are a couple other Department of Defense assets that get mixed in with other um, capabilities and they just need to pick the ones that can get there the most quickly and can uh, perform whatever capability is needed. So something for a large fire may be different than something for a small fire. Um, a, a third example is the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, they asked for the Department of Defense's help with um, the Southwest border. So we have, we have individuals helping, not necessarily doing Custom and Border Patrol's job, but they're helping with other roles so that Custom and Border uh, agents can do what they're trained to do. So um, all of these are, are, are have emergency management capabilities to it. And we, while we are not the emergency managers, we are helping our organization work with the emergency managers. So um, hopefully that answers uh, Stephen's question. Um, so we do have a third question here. Um, what has been the most rewarding and most challenging aspects of your jobs? Oh, wow. Um, yeah, I know. I just saw that one too. Um, I would say the most rewarding is um, the mission accomplishment um, that you get um, when a mission goes correctly because you forecasted correctly the information you provided to your leaders um, and the folks out there performing the mission. Um, it ends up being a good forecast. It, you know, that's the most rewarding part of the job. Um, definitely. Of course, you're not always forecasting. Sometimes you're doing staff work and, you know, other fun stuff. So um, you get through that, but it's definitely the operation side is just always the best, I, I think, um, you know, um, just because of it's like almost like instant gratification. I hate to say it sometimes, you know, um, I know it's like, you know, um, the thing you always try to deter people from, but like you see for it like really quickly, like when a mission goes correctly um, and maybe you had a challenging forecast. Um, and you timed everything out right. I would say also that also is the challenging part of our jobs um, because people's lives are in your hands and you're trying to time out a dust storm, say in Afghanistan, and they're flying a mission right up against, you know, you can see the dust on the satellite coming in uh, and you're trying to get the timing right so that they can get in and get out and maybe, you know, rescue people or do their mission um, and get out before that dust traps them there on the ground and then puts them at a vulnerable, you know, spot. So you want to, you know, that I would say, yeah, you get some, you know, I don't bite my nails, you know, ever, but like I get tempted, you know, just because, you know, at, the, at those points, because, you know, their lives are, you know, like, you know, you're, I mean, you're giving them this information, the best of your ability, the best science we have, um, and they're out there pushing the limits, you know, and, um, you know, of course they can choose to push the limits beyond what you forecast, you know, uh, but that's their choice. But, you know, um, they're going to listen to you. They listen to you as the authority and, you know, and they're going to, um, they're going to, you know, get out and get in based on what you say. So there is, you know, that part I would say is like one of the biggest challenges, you know, <laughs> is, you know, making sure that you're paying attention and getting that forecast right um, when it counts. Um, but boy, is it rewarding when it does, you know, like I say, it's, it's, it's like both of that. So 
um, everybody, I think every weather person in their career has had those moments where, um, you know, you realize what's at stake or even putting a satellite up or, you know, of course now if you're working down at the Cape, they're putting you know, people, you know, up in space again, right? So there, and you got, those are wezos and civilians down there, um, you know, doing the weather and they make the call for those, all those launches down there. So, um, yeah, which is really great. You know, everything works well, but, you know, science at work, people at work and doing the forecast right um, and pushing up the information, you know, so, so that part is really, really cool because people, yeah, I would say the leaders really, really listen to weather when they talk. Um, so it's keeping that credibility, which is really awesome. I think what I could add on to what the Lieutenant Colonel uh, discussed is, is really emphasizing, yeah, it, the, the most challenging and, re and rewarding are those big decisions. Um, they are, there's a lot of pressure on uh, making the right decision, or at least providing the information for the big decision. Um, I think specific to things that I've experienced, so before I was a weather officer, I was a service warfare officer, and uh, we were able to um, provide relief during the tsunami in Japan, and that was definitely the most rewarding experience um, it was very challenging, very emotional, but it was a great experience um, uh, to kind of do something a, a little different. Um, uh, as far as other experiences, uh, I think the other thing is, you know, when you're the weather officer or, or, or the METOC officer, you are the expert. And that's always sometimes kind of hard. That, that's a big burden to uh, carry uh, being an expert in every field. In, in the Navy, we don't really special. So you're, you're a METOC officer, but we don't really specialize based on, well, what type, you know, or do you do weather, oceanography, astronomy, you're expected to be able to do everything. And that's, uh, that's a lot of pressure um, to maintain the credibility, uh, to maintain the training. So it, it is a bit of a challenge to stay on top of everything and be able to give a good answer, provide the right information at the right time. But that's part of the rewarding part is that you have a team of sailors uh, who are there to do that. So when you deploy on a ship, you'll have a team of about 14 to 15 sailors <clears throat> who are specialists in everything from acoustics, anti-submarine warfare, weather, hydrography, and they really are the stars as far as being able to get everything done. And that is <clears throat> definitely by far the most rewarding part of the job is to work with uh, the sailors and airmen and Marines and uh, that we get to work with. Wonderful, thank you. Um, let's see, uh, we got a few minutes left and if we don't have any other questions from the, the field, um, I've got a couple that I'll throw out there just to kind of give a little more scope. But um, so y'all ready? So here's my first one is uh, you, you may have folks who don't realize a career in the military involves uh, not getting to stay in one place, right? So there's there's a lot of moving involved. Can you discuss how often a a, a METOC officer or a WIZO, WIZO I am never going to pronounce this right, a WIZO, um, can expect to move? How often can they expect to move? And why are all these moves necessary? Um, okay, I guess uh, I can jump on that one too. And I know the Navy is going to definitely be different. Um, um, so yeah, WESO. <laughs> I guess that's the, that's the decided pronunciation. Um, yeah, so yeah, moving is part of the fun and adventure of being in the Air Force, I would say, or any military. Um, so you get to definitely, you know, see around the world, um, you know, and um, or maybe not. Sometimes you get unlucky and you just keep floating around the United States, which you're still seeing other states, which is pretty fun, too. Um, but um, yeah, I would say um, usually every it could be two to four years um, is pretty much the norm. We try to keep people an average of three years in one spot. But every now and then there's an opportunity that comes up. Um, such as AFIT, you know, go to, or going to school, getting your master's degree, or you get picked up to be a commander, which is like an awesome selection, something to be selected for. Uh, commander basically is in charge of a, a pretty large unit of people, um, anywhere from 50 to 100 people um, in there, maybe even bigger, just depending on what level of command you're at. So, um, so if you get picked up for these opportunities, you might even move at a one-year point. So 
um, you can kind of see where if you have families, it can get be a little bit tough, but they usually, you know, go along with the adventure. Um, and I guess it would make also having, you know, for spouses, um, having careers um, certainly can be a challenge with, with all the moving, depending on what they do. So I would say that is kind of the drawback. Um, but, um, you know, but sometimes it just depends, you know, on, you know, every family situation. Um, but yeah, every, I would say an average about three years is about the norm um, for the Air Force. Yeah, for, for the Navy, it's about every two to three years. Sea duty is, a, a, for, for officers, sea duty is a two-year tour, and shore duty is a three-year tour. But there's a lot of flexibility there. Um, it, depends, it just depends on what job you're doing. Um, this is my fifth move. We just moved to San Diego. This is our, our, our fifth move. And we actually enjoy, well, before we had kids, we really enjoyed the move. <laughs> um, and now with kids, it is definitely it, the most challenging thing to do, to move with a three-year-old and a, and a one-year-old. But, um, you know, the moves are part of the fun. And, you know, we've lived in Japan, San Diego. Uh, we lived outside of New Orleans. Um, it is challenging, but it's, it's a lot of fun. Um, but those moves are necessary because, at least for the Navy, it's important to build, you know, we have different commands all over the place, and it's important to build a, a broad spectrum of experience, um, both technically, but uh, for us, it's regionally. Um, operating in the Pacific and Indian Ocean is much different than operating in the Atlantic or in the Arctic, um, or in the Arabian Sea, Arabian Gulf. And so part of the moves are to gain more uh, regional experience. They don't want, you know, typically the, the Navy doesn't want us to only have operated in the Pacific. Um, uh, you know, it's good to have good, you know, broad experiences, broad skills. Uh, in the MeTOC, so I think the Navy in general has fewer, I think, duty stations than the Air Force. There's less places to go. And then for me talk, there's even uh, less uh, places to go. Um, you know, basically it's Japan, Hawaii, San Diego, Norfolk, uh, and Stennis Space Center, Mississippi. And you know, if, if, if you're lucky, maybe the Pentagon. Um, <laughs> or uh, there's and and then and then there's one-off places: Italy, um, Belgium. But those are those are the really rare. Um, you know. So for us, we, we've been lucky. We've been able to, you know, do Japan and, and hit San Diego twice. Um, that's uh, pretty lucky as far as Navy goes. Um, but definitely moving is important. Um, a lot of people want to try to homestead, and that, that's not really good for your career. It's important to experience new things. Yeah, one thing about going Navy, you guys are always by water and always by a beach. <laughs> <laughs> Air Force, we get landlocked sometimes. <laughs> Omaha. Yeah. <laughs> I was I was stationed in Omaha. Yes, twice for me. <laughs> oh wow. Wow. Yeah. Now as a reservist, I was living elsewhere and then flying to Omaha to do my work because I was following my active duty husband around. So he's he he gets us to Florida. Yay. And then several times a year I have to go back in the winter to Omaha. And so this reminds me how great Florida was. So um, one last question, I think we have enough time. Um, would you mind speaking about uh, changes, evolutions that you've seen in your respective services with, uh, in terms of uh, diversity, inclusivity, um, uh, kind of the change to the, the way the force is looking in that way? And these are just your opinions. Um, you don't have, yeah. You know, I mean, I guess we need to be official, but, um, uh, yeah, just tell us about what you've seen, whoever wants to go first. Mike, oh, I guess I can start off a little bit. Um, I know the Air Force has definitely um, made, had a lot of initiatives and efforts um, with um, getting people more educated in this over the last few years from what I've seen. Um, like I'd mentioned, I've been in 27 years. Um, so I've, you know, <laughs> seen a lot over the years. I mean, a lot of changes in, in where we evolve. But um, I would say, yeah, there's been a, a big focus on it over the last couple of years, and um, which is good to see to get, you know, just to get people educated more what it means. Um, and I know for when it comes to like promotions and um, getting put in for certain jobs and be, being selected to do certain things, um, we actually have to do analysis on that. You know, I, I've been on a couple boards now being in this job for about a year. Like when we're looking at development teams and people, we actually have to look 
um, at like the diversity of the boards themselves, like who's all sitting on them, you know, are they diverse, you know, and they'll have like all these different characteristics, you know, like do, do people, you know, if they speak different language, gender, you know, race, I mean, everything is really considered and we actually have to do an analysis on the board itself, but then also the candidates, you know, um, so, and we actually have to do reporting on that, like are we, we actually owe a report to our, you know, manpower section, Air Force manpower, um, at each year that actually is making sure that we are focusing on this stuff as we're selecting candidates so that we're not selecting, you know, all male candidates, you know, of, of, one, of one race or, you know, or all like all people, you know, that say um, nobody on this panel has a degree, you know, or, or advanced degree, I should say. Um, like, why are you excluding people with advanced degrees? Um, so we got to make sure that we like continuously have those balances. Um, and like I say, it's, it's been a huge focus uh, the last, I don't know, maybe even like four or five years. Um, I think it's been kind of a focus, but it's really become a focus more so um, as of late. So, which is great to see because that means we have a weak spot and we've identified it, a weakness, you know, in the force. Um, so, you know, we're getting after it and improving it continuously, um, which is good to see. So, um, yeah. All right, I'll uh, hand it over now to Lieutenant Commander Jones. Yeah, thanks. Um, <clears throat> I, I haven't worked in, in manpower, so as far as uh, the Navy's, you know, policies, I'm, I'm I'm not really up to speed on that as far as what the Navy's doing to change the way we assess. But I know in general, the Navy's definitely recently trying to lean forward in uh, really taking a hard look at how we uh, how we assess and how we build diversity rep uh, representation and inclusion into the force. And uh, there's a, a lot of new initiatives, uh, you know, specifically for um, you know, for women to help with, uh, um, you know, the different challenges of having children and how that, that, that inevitably affects uh, careers, uh, whether it's intentional or not. That's definitely an obvious thing that the Navy is trying to do better at. Uh, and that's hard in the Navy because of sea duty. Um, it's, it, it's a challenge to try to work, uh, you know, for, for a lot of mothers, it's a real challenge to work around having kids while being on a ship. And the Navy is definitely trying to look at new ways uh, to make that easier. Um, uh, in the METOC community, we are definitely uh, better represented for, um, for women in our community as a, a, over the broader Navy. Um, I, I don't know the exact numbers, but it's, you know, it's something that like 30 to 40% of METOC officers are, are, are female, which is de definitely higher than the average in the Navy. Um, as, and specifically uh, representation at the command level. Um, again, at, you know, at, at, at various points in the recent years, you know, we've had more female commanders than we have had male, which uh, I, I can't say was intentional or not, but I think it, it was a great opportunity to change the way we think in our community. And uh, I think in the Mita community, because of our technical focus, I think we're better leveraged to, uh, um, to kind of be proactive in that. We're a small community and, and it's easier for us to be proactive to um, you know, to address those concerns than it is, say, for the broader Navy. But um, definitely the Department of Defense and the Navy is leaning forward to just have more conversations. Um, recently, we had a stand down, uh, a Navy-wide stand down for uh, uh, um, addressing white supremacy. And, and that was a really great opportunity to have some really difficult discussions. Everybody put their rank aside and we were able to have a difficult and, and challenging discussions that really hadn't really been we weren't having those discussions in in the open and it was a great opportunity to put everything on the table and really look at uh you know our professionalism and our our character navy wide and um you know as we all know just talking about things uh can lead to uh progress and uh yeah so that's that's my point of view it's not official but it's what i know Here. Uh, thank, thank you both for for uh, for your thoughts on that. Um, it's it's uh, I personally have seen incredible growth in this. So so like uh, Lieutenant Colonel Cunningham, I, I came in in, in the, the mid 1990s when the force looked very different. So um, it's been amazing watching that over a quarter century, actually. So uh, <laughs> I didn't mean to make us feel older than we really are, but uh, I, I was thinking about that recently. Um, 
where I think we, we went a little over time and I'm sorry about that. There's one thing I do want to point out, and I think this goes with the question about uh, interacting with meteorologists in other sectors. Um, we do have Gordon Brooks here, who's a member of the board for operational government meteorology, um, who who does who who is a civilian with the Air Force, and he he mentioned the uh, the collaboration and uh, projects that are done with uh, NCAR and contractors in the industry. So I, I want to point that out. If you're not watching the chat, he he mentioned that there, and uh, absolutely correct. But um, I want to thank the group who. Uh, who uh, chose today to take time to, to dial in and listen to this information. I hope you found it useful. Um, uh, I'm gonna close here and um, just keep tabs on our, our Facebook page and Twitter page if, if you uh, are interested in the future webinars that are forthcoming. So uh, thanks to everyone. Thanks to Lieutenant Colonel Cunningham, Lieutenant Commander Jones for uh, the great information and um,